Hello there. Welcome to my reading of The Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Do make yourself comfortable. And of course, I really do hope you enjoy my reading of this much loved classic. Chapter One. Once, when I was six years old, I saw a magnificent picture in a book called True Stories from Nature about the primeval forest, the forest which has never been cut down and felt an axe. It was a picture of a boa constrictor in the act of swallowing an animal. Here is a copy of the drawing. In the book it said, Boa constrictors swallow their prey whole without chewing. After that, they are not able to move, and they sleep for six months to digest the meal. I then pondered deeply over the adventures in the jungle, and after some work, with a coloured pencil, I succeeded in making my first drawing. My drawing number one was like this. I showed my masterpiece to the grown-ups and asked them whether my drawing frightened them. But they answered, Frightened? Why should anyone be frightened by a hat? My drawing was not a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa constrictor digesting an elephant. But since the grown-ups were not able to understand it, I made another drawing. I now drew the inside of the boa constrictor. The grown-ups always need to have things explained to them. My new drawing showing the elephant inside the boa constrictor looked like this. The grown-up's response this time was to advise me to lay aside my drawings of boa constrictors, whether from the inside or the outside, and to devote myself instead to geography, history, arithmetic, and grammar. That is why, at the age of six, I gave up a magnificent career as a painter. I had been disheartened by the failure of my drawing number one and my drawing number two, Grown-ups never understand anything by themselves, and it is tiresome for children to always explain things to them. So then, I chose another profession, and I learned to pilot aeroplanes. I have flown almost over the world, and it is true that geography has been very useful to me. I can, at a glance, distinguish between China and Arizona. If one gets lost in the night, such knowledge is valuable. Throughout my life I have been in touch with many kinds of serious people. I have lived a great deal with grown-ups. I have seen them intimately, close at hand, and that, I am afraid, hasn't much improved my opinion of them. Whenever I met one of them who seemed to me at all clear-sighted, I tried the experiment of showing him my drawing number one, which I always kept at hand. I would try to find out whether the person was truly understanding. But the answer was always, That is a hat. Then I would never talk to that person about boa constrictors or primeval forests or stars. I would bring myself down to his level and talk about bridge, golf, politics and neckties. And the grown-up would be greatly pleased to have met such a sensible person. Chapter 2 So I lived my life alone, without anyone that I could really talk to, until I had an accident with my plane in the Sahara Desert six years ago. Something had broken down in my engine, and since there was no mechanic or any passenger with me, I decided to carry out the difficult repairs myself. 
It was a question of life or death for me. I had scarcely enough drinking water to last for a week. The first night, then, I went to sleep on the sand, a thousand miles away from any human habitation. I was more isolated than a shipwrecked sailor on a raft in the middle of the ocean. Thus, you can imagine my amazement at sunrise when I was awakened by an odd little voice. It said, Please, draw me a sheep. What? Draw me a sheep. I jumped to my feet, completely thunderstruck. I blinked my eyes hard and looked carefully around me, and I saw an extraordinary small boy who stood there watching me very seriously. Here you may see the best portrait that I was able to make of him later, but my drawing is not quite as charming as its model. That, however, is not my fault. I had been discouraged by grown-ups in my painter's career when I was six years old, and I never learned to draw anything except boas from the outside and boas from the inside. Now, I stared at this sudden apparition with my eyes fairly starting out of my head in astonishment. Remember, I had crashed in the desert a thousand miles from any inhabited region, and yet my little man did not look like a child lost in the midst of the desert, nor to be fainting from fatigue or hunger or thirst or fear. When at last I managed to speak, I said to him, But... What are you doing here? And in answer, he repeated, softly and slowly, as if he was speaking of a matter of great consequence. If you please, draw me a sheep. When a mystery is too overpowering, one dare not disobey. Absurd as it might seem to me, a thousand miles from any human habitation and in danger of death, I took out of my pocket a sheet of paper and my fountain pen. But I suddenly remembered how my studies had been concentrated on geography, history, arithmetic and grammar, and I told the little chap, a little crossly too, that I did not know how to draw. He answered, That doesn't matter. Please draw me a sheep but I had never drawn a sheep before, so I drew for him one of the two pictures I had drawn so often. It was that of the boa constrictor from the outside. And I was quite astounded to hear the little fellow greet my hat-like picture with, No, 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 I don't want an elephant inside a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor is a very dangerous creature, and an elephant is very cumbersome. Where I live... Everything is very small. Draw me a sheep. Draw me a sheep. So then I drew a sheep. He looked at it carefully and said, No, this one is already very sickly. Make me another. And I made another drawing. My little friend smiled gently and indulgently. Don't you see that is not a sheep? It is a ram. It has horns. So I made another drawing. But it was rejected too, like the others. This one is too old. I want a sheep that will live a long time. By this time my patience was exhausted, because I was in a hurry to start taking my engine apart as soon as possible. So I tossed off this drawing, and I threw out an explanation with it. That is only the box. The sheep you asked for is inside. I was very surprised to see a light break over the face of my young judge. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think this sheep will have to have a lot of grass? Why? Because where I live, 
everything is very small. There will be surely enough grass for him, I said. I am giving you a very small sheep. He bent his head over the drawing. Not so small that... Look! He has gone to sleep. And that is how I made the acquaintance of the little prince. Chapter 3 It took me a long time to learn where he came from. The little prince who asked me so many questions never seemed to hear the ones I asked him. It was the words dropped by chance that, little by little, everything was revealed to me. The first time he saw my aeroplane, for instance, I shall not draw my aeroplane, that would be much too complicated for me, he asked me, What is that object? That is not an object, it flies. It is an aeroplane. It is my aeroplane and I was proud to have him know that I could fly. He cried out, then. What? You dropped down from the sky? Yes, I replied modestly. Oh, <laughs> that is funny. And the little prince broke into a lovely peal of laughter, which irritated me very much. I like my misfortunes to be taken seriously. Then he added, So you too come from the sky? Which is your planet? At that moment I caught a gleam of light in the impenetrable mystery of his presence, and at once questioned him. Do you come from another planet? But he did not reply. He tossed his head gently, without taking his eyes from my aeroplane. It is true that on that you can't have come from very far away. And he sank into a long reverie. Then, taking my sheep out of his pocket, he buried himself in the contemplation of his treasure. You can imagine how my curiosity was aroused by this half-confidence about the other planets. I made a great effort, therefore, to find out a little more on this subject. My little man, where do you come from? What is this where I live of which you speak? Where do you want to take your sheep? After a reflective silence, he replied, What I really like about the box you have given me is that he can use it as his house during the night. That is so, and if you're good, I will also give you a string to tie him up during the day, and a post to tie him to. But the little prince seemed shocked by my offer of the string. Tie him up? What a queer idea! But if you don't tie him up, he will wander off somewhere and get lost. My friend then broke into another peal of laughter again. <laughs> But where do you think he would go? Anywhere. Straight ahead of him. The little prince then said gravely, That doesn't matter. Everything is so small where I live. And perhaps, with a little hint of sadness, he added, Straight ahead of him. He cannot go very far. Chapter 4 I had thus learned a second fact of great importance. This was that the planet the little prince came from was scarcely larger than a house. But that did not really surprise me much. 
I knew very well that in addition to the great planets such as Earth, Jupiter, Mars, and Venus, which have been given names, there are also hundreds of others which are often so small that it is difficult to see them through a telescope. When an astronomer discovers one of these, he does not give it a name, but only a number. He might call it, for example, Asteroid 325. Giving such a number to the newly discovered planet or an asteroid makes it very easy for the grown-ups to accept the fact. I have serious reason to believe that the planet from which the little prince came is the asteroid known as B612. The asteroid is so small that it cannot be seen with a naked eye. That is why it has to be observed through a telescope. That observation was by a Turkish astronomer in 1909. On making his discovery, the astronomer had presented it to the International Astronomical Congress in a great demonstration. But because of his Turkish costume, nobody had believed what he said. Grown-ups are like that. Fortunately, however, for the reputation of asteroid B612, a Turkish dictator made a law that his subjects, under pain of death, should change to European costume. So, in 1920, the astronomer gave his demonstration all over again, dressed in style in an elegant suit. And this time, everybody accepted his report. If I have told you these details about asteroid B612, and made a note of its number to you, it is on account of the grown-ups and their ways. Grown-ups love figures. When you tell them that you have made a new friend, they never ask you any questions about essential matters. They never say to you, what does his voice sound like? What games does he love best? Does he collect butterflies? Instead, they demand, how old is he? How many brothers does he have? How much does he weigh? How much money does his father make? Only from these figures do they think they have learned anything about him. If you were to say to the grown-ups, I've seen a beautiful house made of rosy brick with geraniums on the window cells and doves on the roof, they would not be able to get any idea of such a house. You would have to say to them, I saw a house that cost £4,000. Then they would exclaim, Oh, what a pretty house that is. Thus, if you say to them, The proof that the little prince existed is that he was charming, that he laughed, and that he was looking for a sheep. Now if anybody wants a sheep, it proves that he exists. And what good would it do to tell them that? They would shrug their shoulders and treat you as if you were a child. But if you said to them, the planet he came from was asteroid B612, then they would be convinced and leave you in peace from their questions. They are like that. One must not hold it against them. Children should always show great forbearance towards grown-up people. But certainly for those of us who understand life, we could not care less about figures. I should have liked to start this story like a fairy tale. I should have liked to say, Once upon a time there was a little prince who lived on a planet scarcely bigger than himself and who had need of a friend. To those who understand life, that would have given a much greater air of truth to my story. For I do not want anyone to read my book carelessly. I have suffered too much grief in setting down these memories. Six years have already elapsed since my friend went away from me with his sheep. If I try to describe him here, it is in order not to forget him. To forget a friend is sad. Not everyone has had a friend. And if I forget him, I may become like the grown-ups, who are no longer interested in anything but figures. It is for that purpose, again, that I have bought a box of paints and some pencils. It is hard to take up drawing again at my age, 
when I've never made any pictures other than drawing a boa constrictor from the outside and a boa constrictor from the inside since the age of six. I shall certainly try to make my portraits as true to life as possible, but I am not at all sure of success. One drawing goes along all right, another has no resemblance at all to its subject. I make some errors, too. The height of the little prince is not right either. In one place he is too tall, and in another he is too short. And I feel some doubts about the colour of his costume. So I fumble along as best as I can. Now good, now bad. And I hope generally fair to middling. In certain more important details I shall make mistakes also. But that is something that will not be my fault, and I must be forgiven for that. <laughs> my friend never explained anything to me. He thought perhaps that I was like himself. But I, alas, do not know how to see sheep through the wall of boxes. Perhaps I am a little like the grown-ups. I have had to grow old. I will stop the reading here for today. Thank you so very much for listening. I do hope you're enjoying the story so far, whether you're completely new to The Little Prince, or whether this is a favourite of yours. Whether you've heard it read before, or just read it to yourself. I do love these little drawings that we're seeing as we go along. It's a very charming addition to the story itself, I think. Lovely. And I do hope you come back to join me for the next few chapters very soon. You take care now. Read to you soon.